What's up, friends? My name is Indy, and um, this right here, this is uh, my buddy Jay from the Power Group Consulting, and this is Indie Game Business. Today, we've got John Cooney, the CEO of Armor Games, which we're super honored to have, and we got him on his day off. Well, his day off on Friday? What does that even mean? Well, that means they're doing a four-day work week, which apparently we're not, so... <laughs> No, we're not. <laughs> I'm trying to get you to work a four-day work week. You know, yeah. then, then the um <laughs> so yes, John, welcome. And you know, our timing is is good as always because we had more companies yesterday announced they were going to a four-day work week. But before we get into that, let's start where we always start. Tell us how you got into the industry initially and then walk us through your career up to this point. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for uh, inviting me uh, on, my, on my weekend to come come talk. Uh, this is actually our first day of our uh, four day work week, so uh, um, it's kind of fitting uh, that uh, Friday morning we're, we're I'm here to talk about a little bit about how the first week went and then uh, how we got there. But yeah, first off, um, yeah, I'm John Cooney. Uh, I a long time ago, you know, back in high school, uh, I found a program on a uh, computer at school called Macromedia Flash. And I learned that I could make Flash animations. So uh, I, I really liked animation. I really liked doing things frame by frame. I liked uh, building things. I liked um, sharing with friends and, and having a culture around animation. So uh, I decided then that it was really important for me to become an animator, to really start um, building more short form animations start to um, put things out there. I discovered new grounds uh, by the time I got to college and started putting things out there. And, and after a little bit, I ended up getting some animations that got some pickup. I, and suddenly I was finding myself flying to film festivals and uh, traveling to try to screen my films on, on, uh, on theater screens, which was wild uh, for an 18 year old. Um, and but at the same time, as someone who like likes dabbling in everything, I also realized Flash could make games. And I think this was the thing I ultimately was known best for was Flash games. I started making Flash games and just sending them out into the Internet. And uh, these games were just like getting thousands of plays. And I didn't really know from who or how. And a lot of these games were just small games. They were very simple, very um you know, mouse and keyboard kind of uh, arcade titles. Uh, and at that point, Flash games really started to take off in a huge way. There was a lot of people playing Flash games and there was a lot of developers joining the scenes. And uh, by the time I had finished uh, my time at university, I had produced somewhere around 15, 20 titles. And some of them were among the top titles in the Flash game scene. Uh, there was games like Ball Revamped and Dark Cut and um, and then starting to work on games like Hedgehog Launch and uh, Achievement Unlocked. And this is the only level. There were um, all these little tiny games that often only took like five or ten minutes to play. And around that time, too, I started getting sponsorships from a new company called Armor Games. And Armor Games was focused in Flash games. And um, the founder, Daniel McNeely, was emailing me like, hey, let's collaborate on more content. Let's make more games together. And uh, was really um, important and, and vital to me getting into the scene was just having that that support, that financial support and, and emotional support, um, because things weren't always easy for me in college. But having uh, having Dan um, be a friend, someone who was helping me through um, through this uh, process of making games together, it was a, it was a really um, it was a really important critical point because it was also the time where we decided it was time to open an office. It was time to make this official. So we opened an office, we grew the company, and uh, we helped turn Armor Games into one of the largest, uh, one of the largest web game platforms in the world. And uh, through that process, we met a lot of indie game developers, and um, they weren't even really super called indie at the time. They were just, you know, flash devs. They were devs from all over the world, and uh, that's how I got into being at Armor Games. At least the first time. I after a while at Armor Games, I transitioned over to Congregate. Uh, Congregate is also a web games portal, but they were also moving into publishing, especially uh, mobile publishing. But for me, my major focus during my time at Congregate, at Congregate was uh, working on 
uh, their premium games publishing, starting to help them move into publishing, uh, you know, indie PC titles and console titles. So uh, during that time, uh, you know, we uh, managed to publish several successful titles. And then, uh, you know, during conversations with Armor Games, just checking in, seeing how things were going, it was clear that Armor Games at the time had also pivoted to a publisher and were also working on indie games. We're also working on, uh, you know, helping small teams and developers in the same way that they did back in the web game days. And I thought that was really cool. So I, I jumped back on board and helped uh, with their business development, helping find great, great games and developers. And eventually, um, sorry, this is a long story. Eventually um, uh, ended up becoming their CEO and I'm now uh, running uh, our Armor Games Studios, which is our publishing wing and armorgames.com, which is our web side of our business. But that's all of this is about the span of like, I think about 15 years uh, that this all <laughs> happened. So it's I've been a long time in the industry. Um, at least it feels like it. Um, so yeah, that's, that's basically it. I mean, look, it's far shorter than if I had done the very same thing. So it's, it, it's all good. It is cool. interesting that we see so many people in the industry jump like jobs every two years but you've been doing this for 15 years and you've only actually worked at two companies and so that's actually very admirable and impressive so before we get too deep into why we why you started doing the four-day work week let's talk a little bit about how everything is structured right now so you mentioned that you know y'all decided to open an office so you know rewind us a little bit i'm assuming to 2019 did you all have a central office and do you still now or are you all were you remote in the first place yeah it's a good question so to start off with uh we were all in southern california we had a central office everyone was coming into work at the same time same days and what ended up happening was over the course of several years we started having more and more remote contractors employees folks who are working with us outside the office. And over the course of time, the balance shifted. Suddenly the majority was remote. By the time we got to 2019, we were probably 70% remote. We had a we had an office, but um, most people were not coming into the office. Most people were working from their homes or uh, home offices or wherever that might be. So, I mean, I imagine then with, with COVID, it was because, I mean, our whole office is virtual, so not a lot has changed over here. But, I mean, were there any major changes aside from, I mean, do you still have the office, basically? No, we don't have an office anymore uh, to, to, to jump to the, uh, to the conclusion. But uh, what ended up happening was in March uh, last year, it was really evident that COVID was, was a problem and we really needed to... Um, Try to protect the safety of everyone so we sent everyone home um i remember the, the the day we made that decision and sent everyone home and that would be really the last time the company would meet in that office uh by the time we got to october we realized that you know what it's working remote it's uh you know the remote employee lifestyle is working for people really well especially those who used to work in the office every day there wasn't a lot of reason to go back to an office. Um, we're a small company. We're, we're, you know, 10 or 11 people. So uh, at the end of the day, like, you know, it, it made sense for us to just work from home. Not that we super had a choice with COVID, but uh, that decision kind of being forced into that place just was an automatic trial that remote, full remote works for us as a publisher. The, and that's my take on this as well. You know, we're a year, year and a half into COVID and, and working remote. And, you know, we see the stuff in the news about, you know, executives having a tough time trying to bring their employees back into the office. But it's like, mm -hmm. if you survived for a year, year and a half working remote, obviously something is, is working there and you don't necessarily need to go back into an office. Um, so, so what had to change during that time you know, for those of you who were, you know, in that office initially, what did you implement or use to keep, you know, a good level of interactivity since everybody wasn't seeing everybody every day? Yeah, well, we were so remote by that point anyway, we were kind of, we kind of had these um, uh, 
we kind of had this culture already where we felt the need to stay connected. And I think for us, uh, the biggest change for us was having to, we had an office for, I, I think like 12 or 13 years. We had a lot of stuff there. Uh, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of accumulation and we had to end up figuring out where to put all that. And um, for me, I'm, I'm 400 miles from the office. So a lot of stuff got shipped to me. It got moved over to others. But for the interactivity of our um, like our employees and keeping them engaged and, you know, we do a lot of things at our company as a rem remote company do that. One thing is just having events, making sure that we have these like social events that take place online. We play things like Jackbox. We uh, play online games. We've, we've played Among Us. We've done uh, one of our employees is a trivia master and does indie games trivia, for example. Uh, we we try to keep uh, a level of engagement and activity uh, around our culture, but also we think about things like um, making sure we have things that are happening on days of the week. For example, on Thursdays, we have a special topic where um, we have a prompt and everyone uh, like fills in that prompt of like, uh, what, like uh, what is your favorite Halloween movie was our um, prompt this week. So those sorts of things are really important for that engagement and for keeping people feeling connected beyond like, just being heads down and getting their work done, which we think is important for uh, company culture. So what led to, you know, diving into the quotes? And, and by the way, if you're out there, wherever you're watching or listening, Facebook, Twitch, YouTube, the Discord, and I'm missing one, but I can't remember which one it is. Anyway, uh, if you've got a question, pop it in the chat. We'll see it. We'll get it answered live. And, you know, whether it's about a four day work week or indie publishing in general, um, we've got uh, the CEO of a great publisher here. So when did the conversation about a four day week come up and what led to that? Because you said earlier, yeah. you know, just the lead up to it was enough to talk about today. Let's, yeah. let's get rolling there. Yeah. So our four day work week. So, um, it's a pandemic. It went a lot, <laughs> a lot longer than we thought it was going to go. Uh, I still remember when GDC was canceled and I rescheduled meetings in person uh, a month after GDC, thinking it would be over by then. Uh, <laughs> it didn't. Uh, it kept going. And I think we all remember March, April, May, when how hard it was to work. And one of the most important things for us as a company is making sure people are okay. And that's always kind of been our thing. We want to make sure our employees are okay, that they're taken care of, that they're not under ginormous amounts of stress, that they have coverage, that they have that, that they know that there's people who care for them at this company and that games are hard. So let's figure out how to solve these things together. And the problem was that everything was hard and not everyone was okay. Actually, a lot of people were not okay. Everything was really, really stressful. So we, we immediately as a company started going into triage around that. Um, we gave people more time off. Uh, we tried to, we told people, you know what, you should just take off um, one or two days next week. Just do it. It's on the company. Please go do it. Um, around the holidays, we took close to two weeks off just to give, let everyone reset, spend time with their families. We uh, kept trying to do things to try to keep the energy levels good. Uh, and we all know how hard this was. And then uh, by the time there was an insurrection in our company, or not in our company, sorry, in our country, and by the time there was uh, a lot of drama around the elections, by the time that we were getting to February, we all felt like it's it's been a year. This has been a year. Um, and we started to explore what else we could do for our employees. Uh, we, we hit a few different things that were really important for us and started to prioritize it. But the big one that seemed kind of impossible at the time was a four day work week. How do we reduce everyone's hours if only temporarily for the pandemic? And we started to think about what that might look like. And as we started doing that digging, uh, we realized that, you know what, there might be a world where we can just make this permanent, that this doesn't have to be a pandemic thing, that this can be just a kind of radical change in how we view work and a different kind of relationship to work where we think about work balanced with life and that we have enough time to relax instead of hitting Sunday night and being stressed out that we have to go work tomorrow. It was really important for us to think about this 
sort of model within that lens is what can we do for our employees to make sure that they're being taken care of? So that was a lot of our thoughts of how we got here, uh, to, or at least to the idea of a four day work week. So you're trying to look after folks and I know this is an issue in our industry because quite frankly, we are all so passionate about this or we would be doing something else because God knows we'd make more money doing something else. How do you make sure that your employees are taking that time off when you, when you're not in an office and you can't see, it's like, okay, Jay didn't come in today. So I know he's taking time off. Mm -hmm. You know, Jay hasn't come in for the last year. Mm -hmm. How do you make sure they're actually doing this? Because we trust our employees because oh, trust is really important. Um, the concept. <laughs> I, it, it's, I know it seems like a low bar. Um, uh, as my background is in as a game developer and my background is in, um, I, I know what it's like to not be trusted, to not feel like uh, you're being heard. And I think the biggest thing that I've want, I've been a CEO for like just a short time, but the biggest thing I've wanted to bring to my role is making sure we have a culture of listening and, and responding to and building up a trust between our employees so that they feel like they can trust us and we can trust them. And it's the most critical part of making this all go is building that culture. Uh, so we've been really trying to build that culture of trust and care and self-care throughout the entire pandemic and leading up to our four-day work week. And uh, and some of that trust is doing things like not putting spyware on their computers that sees if they're moving their mouse enough to <laughs> get their work done. Like, that's just not us. Our culture has always been, we see your work getting done. We know your work is done. We know you care about your work. We want to hire those kinds of people who will do that and will, you know, work with us to make sure that we're getting things done. And, you know, with the pandemic, we knew not everything was going to be getting done in quite like the same amount of time or there were going to be stressful days where things just, everyone had to drop the things we were doing. And part of that trust was just telling people that's okay, <laughs> that it's hard. Like our ex here are our expectations. Our expectations is this is hard for us. It should be hard for you as well. And I, I think that was just, a big thing we worked on really hard over the last two years, almost two years, um, is, is getting to that point with our team. And so that's why we can trust people for this four-day work week to take it seriously, that we're going to have three days off. Go take that time off. Uh, don't spend your whole weekend answering emails. Like, <laughs> yeah. So we got a question from the Discord server. Uh, how many hours a day are you currently working? And do you know of any other development studios that are also doing this? And I mentioned IDOS, two of their mm -hmm. Canadian studios just announced they were doing it. And the Bug Snacks developer, who I can't yeah. remember the name off the top of our head, I know they are. But anyway, anybody, yeah. anyone else? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let me, let, me, let me answer the first part first. So we spent a lot of time looking at different models. We didn't just look at a four day work week model. Uh, we looked at something called uh, 980 or 89, which was, um, it's a it's everyone works nine hour days and then you get every other Friday off. There was another model where you work 10 hour days and you work four days a week. Uh, there was another model where you, instead of on Fridays, you work on your normal work, you work on a special project. There was, there's a lot of these. There's a, uh, there's one where you work half days on Fridays instead. Uh, just Friday's kind of a lighter day. Uh, I think that's what uh, Eidos did for, uh, as a trial. Um, I might be wrong there. That might be someone else, but. Uh, that's exactly what we used to do at the company yeah. that I was at for like 10 years. Yep. It's yeah. It's half day Friday. Yeah. And I think what we ultimately landed on is that it, like a half day on Friday is, cool like that's better than a full day on friday but uh you're still on thursday night preparing to go to work the next day and especially if you have to commute to work you're commuting in for less hours which is kind of hard um so we made the decision that we wanted people to start relaxing and getting into their weekend on thursday and so the four day week was where we we're going to start and we were really also focused on making sure that we weren't just compressing 
our schedules into something that was unrealistic. Uh, we, we read a lot of studies about productivity and, and how, how are our employees pro productive. And one of the things that struck me really early was that if you start creating like 10 or 11 hour days, like, you know what, you know what crunch feels like? Uh, it's going to start your productivity and the ability to get good work done starts to just slide. So we wanted to keep our hours eight hours a day. And so that's a really long way to answer that question. It's it's 32 hour weeks. We're, we're doing eight hours a day, four days a week. And uh, we're going to keep doing that until it proves either unreasonable or, or whether we it proves perfectly fine. So we'll continue to uh, go at that. And then what was the second part of the question? Sorry. The oh, do we uh, who else do you know that's doing something like this? Yeah, I know. Um, uh, uh, Co-op is doing it and Young Horses is doing that. Um, and we, I think as far as game industry goes and Eidos just announced something, I, I think there's a couple other smaller studios doing things as well in the game industry. But I think that's, unless I'm missing someone, which I, I probably am, I think that's it. It's pretty, it's a pretty small footprint of maybe five developers. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, the uh, developers, I believe of uh, Celeste, uh, that studio, is um i think they're doing a project day uh kind of which is kind of like a hybrid uh which is really cool too uh, so it's a pretty small group it's like maybe less than probably less than a dozen i'm guessing overall i'm sure others are doing trials as well and haven't announced anything yeah somebody um on the server just said outer loop is doing it too i mean speaking oh, right. from experience i can tell you that half day friday thing I mean, one when it was announced at the company that we were at you know, we were all like ecstatic about it. You know, this, this is awesome. Half day Friday. The reality is you, you like go into work knowing you're only going to be there four hours and it's like, all right, so what do I need to do bare minimum to get through four hours here in the office? And then, cause you're, you're mostly tuned out that, you know, for that four days, in, for four hours anyway. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a, a good point. So uh, black out mind ask how many weeks vacation do you get at armor games? It really, de it really depends. We're in the process of readjusting it. Um, I, I think most people in the company are getting anywhere between two and three weeks of vacation, which is, I think, pretty standard in the game industry at this point. Um, we, we're trying to figure out how big, this is something we haven't figured everything out about the four day work week. One of the things we're trying to figure out is how vacation days work uh, against a four day work week. Um, we're, we're giving a lot we're, we're giving people essentially 50 or 52 days more off a year. Um, how does that work <laughs> against that? Um, and so we're still trying to balance these things out. But overall, I think, if anything, what we've been doing, this is like phase one was um, us working on a four day work week. Phase two has been us redoing all of our benefits. We're actually adding many, many more benefits to our employees um, uh, so that they can have things like dependent care and being able to uh, take care of the kids and be able to uh, fund that and uh, working on um, uh, we've extended our sick leave quite a bit. So like we're, we're trying to add as much as we can as well beyond four day work week. Again, trying to make sure our, our, our employees are better than just okay. All right. As, as one small company CEO to another, how did you track vacation days before you did this? Yeah, so uh, we run all of our HR and uh, vacation tracking software through a, a product called Gusto. And that kind of take care that takes care of everything. People just flag where when they want to take time off and then go take time off. I mean, it's, it's not, um, there's no high scrutiny. It's like someone needs a day off. They don't need to tell us why they just go. You see, that, that's the way that I, I mean, because one, I mean, I, I haven't looked at, actually looked into HR software because we're like six people, but it ta it takes more time for me to track how many days off you've had and taken and whatever than I really care to do. You know, it's like as long as the work is getting done, I don't care. Take a take a you know yeah. few days off, but that's that's part of what you know I've had trouble doing as a CEO is making sure people are taking that time off. That's the downside to not tracking it. You don't know if it's been like a year and a half since somebody had a day off. We, um, we, we are getting yeah, we, lots of questions for you. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> so uh, 
really interesting that you opted for 32 hour weeks. How does that affect compensa compensation for both existing and new employees? Yeah, we pay people the same. Like, like our, our enough. There you go. yeah, it's, it's, well, for us, it's thinking about on our end, like as a, as, like as an employer, like, why are we doing this? And we're trying to strike that work-life balance. We think people with a good work-life balance are going to get just as much done. And I think for um, a lot of us, you know, we know what Fridays feel like. We know what, how we go into Friday, just completely exhausted. And instead of going into Friday completely exhausted, what if we gave people three days to just come into work, like fully refreshed and good, like just good. And I think that's always been our philosophy is that um, if people are good and coming into work and happy, they're going to be productive and they're going to get enough work done. That said, we're we're on week one of our trial. So uh, this is something we're measuring. We told everyone to um, try not to feel like you're pressured into getting every single ounce of work done every single minute that you're here during this trial. Don't like as much as you can. We're working under a hypothesis that this is what's going to happen when we do this. And we're not going to know until we try. So it was really important for us not to um, tr get in front of people be like, hey, you didn't get X, Y, Z done this week. Um, why didn't you get that out on Friday? It's really important for us to, to model that and to say, you know what? This is on us. We're telling you this is we're going to be doing this thing. If, if, if all of us end up not getting as much work done, then that's on us. It's not on you. You didn't update Jira today. So, you know, that that's a bad demerit. Uh, I mean, that actually jumps straight into one of the questions that we've had from from Twitch. Calix, Calix, I didn't realize you were in Mexico. I don't know where I thought you were, but I didn't realize that that's where you were. Uh, one, they said the half day on Fridays is an unofficial rule at many places in Mexico. But um, then they ask, what happens if there's pressure to finish some tasks or emergencies? Yeah, it's publishing. So that's uh, that's often our world. Uh, I know one of our employees is trying to navigate everything into certain lot check right now. And that is uh, uh, that is a wild task and sometimes requires things to happen on days where we're not working. And that's hard and that's uh, stress. And I know uh, myself when I go travel for business events, I know, for example, Gamescom, I'm often traveling on a Saturday and Sunday. So there's days that we often have to, you know, sacrifice on our personal time. What we do as a company is that any time there's time that has to be taken outside of normal hours, we provide comp days or comp hours. So it's really important for us to acknowledge the fact that people are working. And uh, sometimes, for example, if, if we have an employee who has to come in on a Friday, like myself at, at, for this, because uh, it's my weekend right now, uh, what we'll do is we'll say, you know what, you're out for half a day on Friday working. Uh, let's let's just give you half a day off on Monday or Tuesday. We just want to make sure we give that time back in some way. I, I think it's fantastic that you include, you know, this podcast is, is working because this started as just my attempt to have something to do on a day or week. And now it's just grown completely out of control. Um, does the eight hour work week include lunch? Yeah, so most of our like U.S. U.S. labor laws, we have to take lunch and breaks. Uh, so uh, your eight hours are usually you working. But that said, we don't deeply monitor our employees' hours. Like as long as you are coming close to eight hours a day, that's fine. Um, uh, I know uh, for me, uh, I'll give more examples. For example, um, I, I go pick up my kids from preschool and I come back and, and bring them back as well two days a week and. Um, for me, it's just going out and going and do that. Uh, I just, you know, our company allows our employees to work around their needs and their time that they have. And so uh, for us, a lot of our employees are West Coast, East Coast, other places in the U.S. So um, we we just we ask everyone to maintain around eight hours of work a day. And then if there's other things that slot in there, that's fine. So and, and I'm going to let Dan catch up on some of these questions before I start throwing more of them out at you, but I'll, I'll hit some of, of mine in here. Okay. Why do you think there are more companies doing this now? Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting question. Um, I think like us, we're tired. <laughs> we're, we're tired. It's a pandemic and it's stressful. Uh, like we've mentioned before, I'm just going to keep bringing up my kids. Sorry, but, uh, 
I have kids and they're at home and we're at, we're all at home in the pandemic together and all of this is just extra hard. And I think it's also we're also going through a really interesting like revolution in labor right now. And I think it's been it's been a long time coming, but you know, there's a lot of companies now offering $15 an hour or more as minimum wage. There are companies that are uh, being asked by their employees to go fully remote so that people don't have to commute. People have more time to spend with their families, with people that they love. I think that we are reevaluating what is important to us and seeing the effects of the pandemic, which is that at the end of the day, we are human <laughs> and that it's really critical for us to think about life through that lens. And we'll continue to see change. I think across the board. I know there's things going on at, at Kellogg's right now for better, like more fair wages, more fair working conditions. Um, this is a cycle the U.S. has gone through uh, time and time again. It's the reason why the 40-hour work was work week was even established, because at the time it was considered a great limit on how many hours we should be working a week. In deep reality, a lot of people who are 40 hour a week salaried employees don't work 40 hours a week. They work 50 hours or 60 hours a week because employees can, employers can take advantage of that. And I think for a lot of companies, it's just a realization that uh, employees have power, that employees uh, are, ha are people, that this is a time to reconcile that difference. And for us, uh, a company that's, tried or at least tried really hard to be empathetic and care about our employees it's it was just it was a time of reconciliation for ourselves and to think about why we are doing the things we do why do we work 40 hours and i think for me personally um I, i'm someone who used to crunch a lot i used to i still remember the one day I was working in an office and the security guard knocked on the window at 4 a.m. wondering why I was there. And that was kind of a point for me realizing that, you know what, this isn't normal, that this isn't, that I don't feel healthy doing this. I think it's a lot of things coming together at once. I know I'm rambling, but I think no, it's a lot this entire of, podcast is rambling. You're perfectly cool, on task. Rad. Don't worry about it, John. Yeah, that's yeah. what it's all about is rambling, right? Cool. I just think we're at a critical point once again in the U.S. around labor and how we think about our relationship with work is being reevaluated pretty hard. So, uh, Dan, do you want to hit Liam's next yes, question? Yes, I do. Discord? Yes, I do. Liam Sorda, he's, uh, we are currently super early stage with our studio, though are just about to make our first couple of full-time hires. You mentioned Gusto for HR Bits, though I was curious if there was any other tooling you found particularly useful. Notion is pretty much our bread and butter right now. Yeah, that's cool. I like Notion. Uh, you know what? That's something we're actually working on right now. Uh, for the longest, like, again, Armor Games is a 15, 16-year-old company, so we have a lot of legacy things that we're flipping right now. Uh, but one of the things we've been working on uh, quite a bit is uh, doing more than just Google Docs, Google Drive tools. Google Drive <laughs> tools are amazing. We, we spend our lives in Google Drive, but uh, things like Airtable tools that just really uh, help accelerate the things that you do and make things more powerful. And, and those are things that um, are kind of expensive out of the gate when you start looking at pricing, but end up just paying dividends and being high quality tools that end up uh, servicing your your company and and making your employees feel more productive and and you're not searching 500 hours in your Google Drive trying to find something. Uh, we're thinking about switching a lot of our documentation and things to a format like uh, README, uh, just because a lot of that lives in Google Drive. Sometimes hard to find, uh, which README will allow us to create like kind of like a wiki kind of knowledge base. Those are those kind of things are um, all in progress right now, and um, I know. Uh, Sean at our company is uh, is digging into a lot of it, and I know um, August at our company was really uh, vital for us getting Airtable set up for a lot of our things that we do. I had to Google that. I'm not familiar with Airtable, but now that I'm looking at it, you know what we found internally is that Notion has been able to take a lot of these other systems that we use and be done with it. This looks like what do you use Airtable for? Because this looks like a prettier Notion. 
Yeah, Airtable is if you've never seen Airtable before, it's like uh it's like it's spreadsheets plus plus. It is like uh it's it's a really good version of spreadsheets where you can do like deep linking to other spreadsheets and like um we use it for everything from uh tracking uh leads that we're working on uh leads meaning uh games that are currently being sent to us for evaluation for publishing to uh tracking data around which events we're going to who are we sending to those events what are the commitments there we uh and then that deep linking allows us to see our previous history with that event and making sure that that's being documented as well it's really good at um being this kind of two-dimensional three-dimensional spreadsheet uh, tool and it, just coming from the publishing side, we live in spreadsheets. So it's uh, the tool has been incredibly good at uh, making us more productive and 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 organizing our information in a really good way. All right. So you mentioned crunch a little while ago, and that's an interesting subject for this. And I you know I know I've been a developer, I've been a publisher, uh, I've been an agent, I've been a consultant. Mm -hmm. Developers end up having more crunch than publishers do, but a lot of people don't realize publishers actually end up having crunch as well. How do you think this is all going to fit in because given the industry's issue with, with crunch crunch and time management, I mean if you're working a 5-day work week and you still have to crunch you're still going to have to crunch on a four day weekend, but it seems like you're going to be doing more of it. How do you offset that? Yeah. So I think crunch and four day work week kind of fall under this umbrella, of like work life balance thing. That's really important to us. Uh, crunch is something we have been working on individually. And uh, from the time I started restarted at the company the second time, it's been a really high priority for me that our employees don't enter crunch. And what we've been trying to do is making sure we're having check-ins with our employees to that to talk about, you know, how much work do we have on our plates? When is it a point where instead of adding more to someone's plate, we hire someone? Or how do we make sure that we're all lifting together and that we have, you know, the right kind of coverage for the right kind of things? The crunch crunch is on the employer as a like more so than the employee in a lot of ways. And so for us, we've been really not just like, you know, hey, don't crunch, don't stay up late, don't, you know, take a day off. Like we, we're trying to be better than that, just that. We're trying to be anti-crunch. We're trying to figure out how we can not stop our employees from crunching or like spending that extra long evening or if they have to spend that extra long evening because GDC talks are due on Tuesday night, which was me. Um, it was really important that I realized that I did that and gave myself the time the next morning to come into work late. And those sorts of things are really important. There has to be a balance to these things. I don't, we don't feel crunch is appropriate at our company. And whenever we see it, we try to address it. It, it is. And it's difficult when you are working remote because in some ways you are always at work. You know, when your office is through the next doorway, it's hard to take that step back and you have to, you know, even, you know, from your own side, you have to take that realization that, okay, look, maybe I just need a day to relax, step back, not stress about something and just recoup. And it, that's, it's hard to do. I mean, it's hard to do pre COVID and all the other shit that's going on in the world, much less, you know, you know, now when everybody's like this. So um, I, I agree. It's, it's something that is a major issue. And I've been a long time fan of look, crunch is not the developer's problem. Crunch comes from somewhere up the food chain of, you know, shit being changed and things being added to the development and all that sort of stuff. Um, so what kind of changes are you making systemically internally? to accommodate less hours, you know, are you, are you publishing less games? What, what are, what's changing internally like that? Yeah. Again, our hypothesis is that folks will just be as productive. And, um, we, we think that's because everyone's going to be rested and good. Uh, that might not be the case. That's just our guess. But, um, overall, like the biggest changes we had to do is move all of our Friday meetings and tell our partners that we're going to be doing this. And, uh, for us, I don't think anything immediately will be changing. I don't want to um, start kind of 
like we're in a trial. We want to make sure we're doing this right. It's going to take some adjustment. So our goal was really to feel out that adjustment and work with our employees to make sure we were doing things right and that we weren't like employees. If we're not, again, we're not in the business of making our employees suffer. And we want to make sure that people feel like they're getting their work done and that they're fulfilled. We have uh, measures that were like, as a publisher, it's sometimes harder to measure how much work is getting done because um, we're not, um, it's it's not always a, a, a quantitative thing of, of how much work is getting done each week. It's a lot of it is just feel and, and acknowledging and like sensing out how we're doing. Uh, for, I know at least for one of our employees who spends a lot of time uh, task managing and dragging things around in, um, in their task manager, they said this week with four days, uh, it just kind of put him in a little bit different mindset. And he ended up getting just as much done in four days as he did five and didn't feel any additional burden or stress from that, which was already a good sign for us. For everyone else, we're sending out surveys. We have a survey pretty much going out every week or so that just is, it's fully anonymous. People can put whatever they want on that sheet. They can say, this is the worst thing in the world. And um, uh, our first one's going out on Monday because we think uh, Monday is kind of the real official start of this trial because we haven't had a three-day weekend yet and we went straight into a four-day week. Uh, so this is like the first real version of what we're doing. So uh, how many people are at Armor Games? Yeah, we're we're small. Uh, we're, uh, we're around 10 or 11 people right now. So yeah, that's what I always love about Anonymous. It's like, I know it's Anonymous, but I know exactly what you're working on and I know who wrote this. And so mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. it's always, always tricky with, with small companies. So how long do you plan on doing the trial? And like, what are the metrics that you're going to be looking at to determine whether this is something you want to stick with or if there needs to be a plan B? Yeah, so this trial will be at least a month, but I think it'll be longer than a month. If I'm going to be honest, it's going to take time to feel this out and feel the long term effects of what this does for people. So I, I think realistically, this is going to run until the end of the year, at least. And then we're going to have a pretty good sense of how things are going. Um, we have, we're, we're having check-ins with everyone. We're making sure that people feel like they have a place where they can talk about how this is going. Um, generally, there are benchmarks we're looking for. One, are we all falling behind? Is this, uh, is this not working? I think that one will be pretty easy to suss out um, because I think our employees are pretty good at at um, self-regulating and understanding uh, whether their work is getting done or not. And I know our employees, even before this event, you know, it, it wasn't always just like, hooray, hooray, we're going into a four-day work week. There was concern. There was like, man, I feel like we work really hard here. Like, um, what's this going to do for us? And I'm just some of the questions, some of the answers are, I don't know. I don't know <laughs> what this is going to do for us. We have to try it, though, uh, to see. Um, but overall, um, fairly unanimously, the the company wanted to do this, wanted to try this and and uh, give it a go and see how it worked out for them. Well, I think we should do a post-mortem podcast on this at the beginning of next year. Yeah, for sure. I, I'm happy to come back and, and talk about it. Uh, awesome. We'll have a lot more information by then. But yeah, I think one of the things we also wanted to make sure our employees know is that if this doesn't work, we're gonna try to figure out how to make it work, and if we can't try, it, and if we can't figure out how to make it work, we're gonna try other options. Um, again, it's the spirit of of just trying, seeing what works for our company, and making sure that um, our employees feel like they're taken care of. Well, you know, Dan, our next conference is coming up at the first of December, which will give John like a solid two months in there to start testing these things. So, I mean, John, right. would you be open to a four day work week, how it's going talk, you know, in December. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll come back and we can talk about um, all the ups and downs so far. Um, very happy to do that. So, you know, you mentioned that you were, you started out as a developer and, you know, you had that 4 a.m. security guard knocking, why the hell are you still in the office conversation? How did your experience as a developer influence what you're doing now on the publishing side of the table? Yeah, um, I have a, a lot, a lot of respect for game developers. I have 
I know what it's like being in a place where you're doing something impossible, which is making a video game. Video games are impossible things that exist, and I don't know how. Um, and a lot of my excitement about working and moving away from being just a solo developer and wanting to be a publisher is I wanted to help others. It was really important for me to help other creative people be creative and help them figure out all the other pieces that make everything work. And so coming at this from a developer, um, a lot of it is just empathy for what they're going through, that that bug is crippling their game and we can't figure out why, that uh, deadlines are shifting again and again and again, and how how do we control this? And it, it, it's hard. Um, I think for me, the biggest thing that we've also tried to extend to our developers is just being compassionate and thinking about them as, as again, human beings. I know, again, low bars, but like we really- <laughs> That's like, not a low bar though. That's the thing. It's, that's like what's we, scary about the industry right now. It's reflective. Like I think a lot about my experiences as a game developer and the hard things that I went through. And I know that developers are going through that all the time. And um, as a publisher, we go through hard things all the time too, but it doesn't mean we have to um, put that on the developer. And uh, we, we do our best to create as a publisher an environment that nurtures development and that uh, supports developers in the ways that they want to be supported. And a lot of that just comes from my experience. It comes from the experience of other people at our company who were game developers who worked in, and it extends to everything we do. We have folks who were writing for press. We have folks who uh, worked at IGN. We have um, people who genuinely care. And I think that for us, that level of care is not just for our employees, it's for everyone we work with. So I got to apologize. I missed one of the questions earlier from Twitch. Uh, Pretty French man says, could you explain why you guys think this is working for you? And do you think it makes sense to do it as a solo developer? Yeah. Uh, why do I think this, this works for us? Um, again, uh, it comes down to trust of our employees and it also comes to our hypothesis, which is that rest like people who are rested and good uh, are usually going to be better coming back to their jobs and doing their jobs i so i think that's like just kind of key to all this is just trying it and i think for us as a small publisher as a small studio or just small company in general we are we can be fast to pivot we can be fast to address problems it we're, we're not um, a gigantic three ten thousand person company where throwing everyone into a four day work week is it is like, there is so much overhead to doing that. So we want to try um, because a lot of folks want to try uh, and, and we think we can give back this data and this uh, process that we went through to those folks. Um, the second part, sorry, I always, I have a short term memory. Uh, what was I, the second oh, part of the question? Uh, does it make sense to do this as a solo developer? Does it make sense to do this as a solo developer? That's a good question. Um, I think that um, just like any size studio, you need to measure it and try it. Uh, I think large studios should try it. I think solo developers should try it. That said, I think that you, you kind of have to plan it out. It's not just something you decide, you wake up and you say, you know what, it's time for four days. Um, I think there has to be some realistic expectations and goals and ways of tracking and monitoring your own uh, progress and work. Uh, you need to think about w how confined you want your own trial to be. Um, you know, is this going to be something you trial for a month? Is it going to be something you trial for a week? Um, and just kind of measure it and and find way. Or and if you can't find, if you don't know how to measure it, find ways to measure it because I think that's the only way you're really gonna um, you're gonna see your progress. It's I think it's a little harder for solo developers because you're kind of just looking into what you're doing all the time in the same way that when you're working on a game as a solo developer, it can be really challenging. You get kind of that tunnel vision of your own vision and your own game, and you have to go seek outside like input and feedback into how things are going. I think that could be really helpful here as well. Um, it might make sense that a few solo developers decide to go in together to try this and have that uh, venue to talk about their progress and to discuss whether this fits them or not. It's really, um, I think every studio is incredibly different. I think every 
uh, everyone has set up their culture and the things that they do in very different ways. And I think uh, reading into that and establishing how to work within what you've created is going to be really important. I think it almost is more important to do it as an indie dev than, I mean, as a solo dev than it is as a bigger company, because, you know, like you said, we put so much pressure on ourselves to get stuff done and to do it. I mean, I know I've probably worked more hours since indie game business took off with the conferences and anything than I did just running the Powell group, but it's, when you're solo and you're doing stuff on your own, you don't have as much of that visibility of what's going on around you. And okay, wait, these people are only working four day weeks, or these people are trying to limit themselves to doing something when you're working on a project that's that personal, like a solo team does, then you get very engaged with it. And that can be very dangerous. And so I, I would say, yeah, it's even more important. So switching gears a little bit. And so we got about 10 minutes, folks. Um, John's going to be on school bus patrol shortly, um, which the reason, ironically, that we usually end at, you know, one o'clock Eastern time because I'm on school bus patrol at that point in time. So how has, you know, COVID in general changed the publishing side of, of indie games? And I know this is probably mm -hmm. a big one to jump into with just 10 minutes left, but um if anybody else has questions, get them in quickly. But, you know, I know, you know, Armor Games is, you know, they like web games for a long time, and then you moved into PC console games. How did the pandemic last year change what you're looking for? How you, you know, do things? Did it open up new models? Did you see more revenue? Did you, how, what was the changes that you saw on the, on the indie publishing side? Cool. Yeah, that's a big question. Um, let's start. I mean, I, I talked at great length about how the pandemic emotionally has affected all of us. And I think that's the number one thing to uh, as far as what what are we what have I been seeing across indie publishing? I think the other thing that it's really opened up is um, thinking about all of our developers who are also in a pandemic, who are also stuck at home and now working remotely. Um, we work with a lot of indie teams and they're all over the world and they're all going through different versions of COVID. And I think acknowledging that and understanding that was also something that we needed to wrap our heads around. Um, some of our devs are in regions where it's, um, it's close to impossible to get a vaccine. And we take that for granted because we're here in the U S and, uh, we're, we have just, we're just sitting on vaccines, which is wild to me. Um, we, uh, we, there was that acknowledgement of the human element of that. But I think if we start to go into like the business of indie games and, and where everything's at, um, the switch uh, to a digital world was really um, was something we had to pivot to very quickly. Uh, we were used to going to PAX and to Gamescom uh, for uh, these large events. And these events, we would be looking for the next games we would be looking to sign or uh, showcasing our games at these events or meeting with partners, meeting with uh, going to E3, meeting with, you know, Nintendo and Sony, having these uh, touch points with partners. And uh, with, uh, with COVID, all of that really um, disappeared. And the way that we look at marketing and events changed a lot as well. Um, so we were focusing on these digital showcases and all the digital showcases were brand new. So we didn't know, which ones were good or not. Uh, we didn't know, uh, you know, we, we kind of knew E3 was kind of digital. So that was like something we wanted to look more into, but there was things that that came about like, you know, Wholesome Direct and um, and digital versions of GDC and digital versions of Gamescom, Indie Arena Booth, like all these things were new to us in a really, in a way that was um, hard for us as a publisher, because as a publisher, we've built up this huge knowledge of how to do these things. And suddenly we were in a lot of ways um, back in like, we're back in the deep end. We're trying to figure out how to, how to make this all work and how to uh, measure it and figure out, you know, what's working for marketing. What, how, how do we find games? How do we find games now, now that we're not at GDC and Gamescom? Um, but I think one of the biggest things that it really helped us start on the path of in a really big way is 
going to more events from regions that need to be seen and heard. Uh, the fact that now everything was digital meant that we could go to regional events that we could have otherwise had a really hard time as a small publisher traveling to. So we got to meet a lot more developers uh, from a lot of different regions. Uh, and that was a really kind of cool silver lining to this whole COVID thing that I hope it sticks around. Uh, I want to meet more developers from more places. Um, a lot of the time when we're at GDC or Gamescom, we're often uh, surrounded by developers from uh, territories and countries that uh, have had game development scenes for a very long time, not these emerging scenes that are really critical and important. Uh, as a Flash developer way back in the day, uh, emerging game cultures came out of Flash games, and it was really important. Uh, and it's really important to me that we have that visibility and that in going to these events. So um, that's kind of the silver lining for me. I, otherwise, what else has changed? Um, you know, really, everything's just late. <laughs> that's the other thing. Too. <laughs> uh, maybe that's games in general, but um, especially for us, just, you know, again, and acknowledging the human element that humans make video games. Uh, it's really important for us to hear our developers and hear and like COVID's hard. Everything's been hard and and knowing and that we can be patient because we're patient with our own employees has been really important. So um, we have a lot of games shipping late and uh, we have, you know, if you go on Twitter any day, there is a developer posting a wall of text saying, sorry, our game is late. And I think that um, I, I kind of have a, a sigh of relief every time I like, I know, <laughs> I know often players are it's, it's, um, it, you know, if you're really looking forward to a game as a player, that kind of that's kind of not what you want to see. But I think as a um, as a professional in this industry, every single time I see one of these and it says, "Hey, sorry, we're shipping late," it's just been really hard lately. Um, watching the outpouring of love for that and that, hey, you guys take that time, work on the thing, get it done in the way that's sustainable for you. Sustainability is like so critical. Um, so. That's the other big thing we've been saying. But anyway, that's me rambling again. But uh, yeah, that's that's kind of my answer. And we got a new question in here from Eric over yeah, it's on a good one. YouTube. So with more time away from work, do you think more developers will do more side projects? And do you think that's a good thing or a bad thing? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I really like when people make things for themselves. Uh, like. I know a lot of, I know a lot of like solo indie developers are already making things kind of for themselves, but also kind of for their audience. Um, but I think learning is important. I think taking time for yourself to work on a thing that, or a project, even if it's not in games, is really important. I think it will kind of open up that freedom to kind of explore things and to uh, be curious, uh, to go take classes, to go do things. I know one of our employees at our company told me that they're spending their Fridays learning how to scuba dive. They really wanted to learn how to scuba dive. They haven't had the chance to do it. Fridays are now scuba diving day. Um, they're gonna, they've been doing all their coursework and they're getting it done. So I think that on the surface, it seems fine. Um, but um, I also know that just, it's really hard being at a computer five days a week. It's really like unplugging and doing things that for just a hot moment aren't games is really important and that's maybe that's odd going on to like this this podcast talking about this but like i think just as important it is to make games it's also important not to make games uh so i i generally encourage people to try to unplug and you know i think even if that's even if that's going and playing more games or you know go going to a movie or something like you know i i think it's really critical so yeah i think it's fine but you know at the end of the day people need to people need to close close unity and and or game maker or whatever tool they're using for for just a moment I, I agree except my you know time away from working tends to be time away with playing video games with you know my son or by myself uh john i really appreciate you taking your first your first day off and, and coming on you know, especially this early in the morning for you and doing this uh i think it's a fantastic thing that you're doing and we need more companies that understand that you know work-life balance like you all do so you know kudos to that and leave I'm the going charge to, 
hold you to your, you know, December talk at our conference on, you know, how this is going so far. Uh, mm -hmm. But before we leave, what do you have coming up at Armor Games that you want to plug? <sighs> <laughs> there's some uh, video games uh, yeah i guess we do work on video games for sure um yeah our our next launch coming up in um pretty soon the end of the year is a game called the last stand aftermath it is uh with our legacy and flash games we worked with the developer who worked on the original flash game the last stand which has hundreds of millions of views online and plays uh, one of the top flash games of all time we've it's been fully reimagined. It's now this this really gorgeous roguelike uh, in a post post apocalyptic world. Um, that game will be coming out on uh, multiple platforms, console and Steam, and that one's coming up. We're, we have a lot of great games that we're working on. Games like Snacko, Bear and Breakfast, uh, Lumberjack, The Tartarus Key. Uh, they're all just it's a it's a hot mix of different kinds of games. Everything from uh, uh, a, a game about a bear committing eco-terrorism to uh, uh, cat farming to uh, exploring a, a very haunted house, very creepy house uh, in, in a very like dripping in a PlayStation 1 aesthetic. So, you know, we have lots of cool stuff that we're working on. So, um, yeah, just check out our games because we have those three games combined together just sounds like my life. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right, have, so where yeah. can people go to check them out? Yeah, you can go to your favorite video game console or, or PC platform, but uh, you can also go to armorgamestudios.com. We have uh, all our games just sitting there waiting, waiting for you to check out. Sitting there awesome. waiting for you. Awesome. All right. And with that, thank you very much. We'll let yeah. you get on with your day and we'll get on with ours. And hopefully we will see everybody next week. All right, make sure and check us out on Discord, discord.gg slash indie game business, and all of our podcasts are up on there are anchor.fm slash indie game business. Or you can just like type in indie game business into any browser or Google or whatever you want, and then there will be a bunch of stuff. You'll learn about all the conferences coming up, you'll learn about all the podcasts, the YouTube channel, Facebook, all of, we got all the goodness. So check it out. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, John. Bye. See y'all.